solezza tan profunda. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Um, and just as a heads up for our uh, panelists, we are going to record this just because uh, currently students are quite busy and they will probably just want to go back and uh, relook at the recording later on when we publish it. Um, so uh, as we get started, just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us on our uh, graduate student panel. Uh, we have Jennifer and Rosie joining us and I'll go ahead and let them do their own introductions. Um, my name is Alexandra Gonzalez, and I am a uh, fourth year legal studies major at Berkeley. And I'm um, so glad for both of you to, to join us tonight. So Jennifer, why don't you go ahead and get started and then uh, Rosie can go after. Hi, my name is Jennifer Cardenas. Uh, my pronouns are she, ella. Um, I recently graduated from Columbia University, class of 2021, yay. Um, and I am currently located in California. Hi everyone, my name is Josie Rios. My pronouns are she, her, ella. Um, I also graduated from Columbia University, but I'm in the School of Social Work. Yeah, so um, I went to UCLA for my undergrad. Um, and yeah, I'm currently working at the Public Defender's Office in Santa Barbara. Great. Um... So we can just go ahead and get started. As a general overview, what we're gonna do is have um, both you, Jennifer and Rosie answer about 10 or so questions that we've came up with as a group. And then we'll give you the floor to talk about it for as long as you would like to answer the questions. And if we have time at the end, if there's any other questions or clarifying questions, we'll go ahead and open it up and do kind of a free form uh, for any other additional questions. Um, so the first question we have is, what did you do after graduation? Um, if I, either one of you want to go ahead and start. <laughs> I can go. <laughs> so, um, so after I graduated, so I went to undergrad at UCLA. So after that, I actually worked for the UCLA prison education program um, for about two years. And so I led um, professors and current college students to taking classes inside different prisons. Um, so I was doing that work. And then I was also doing, my background is in organizing. So I was also doing organizing in the community, doing that kind of work um, in the immigrant rights movement. And then, so that was for undergrad and then um, after graduate school, I was working at the Bronx Defenders, and then I most recently started working at, well, not that recent anymore, but I was, I started, I began working at um, the uh, Santa Barbara Public Defenders Office doing holistic defense. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Um, so where do I start? Um, after graduation, I moved back to California. So I'm originally from California, Fontana, California. And so let me preface first. I am 34 years old. I'm a non-traditional student who also is low income, who's queer, obviously Latina. And I was a community organizer when I was younger. I didn't think college was a pathway for me at a young age, um, just because of all, mostly the income. And mostly like, I didn't have the opportunity to actually go back to school when I, um, right after high school. So I went into more of an advocacy route. I've always been part of grassroots organizations. Eventually I ended up in community college here in uh, Montana. And then I realized that as much as I protested and as much as I advocated, I went to city hall and voiced my opinion. Um, there wasn't a lot of changes. All the people here, while it's a blue purplish county, San Bernardino County, it's very um, red leaning and it's very Republican and they don't really advocate for people. So I made it my goal to be someone that could step up to them. And I ended up applying to Columbia University in order to fight the fact that even if I went to a school here, these white incumbents would still have a lot of things over me, right? They're still, I'm still a second generation born here. I'm still a first generation college student. 
I'm still a woman. I'm still all these other things. But what I wanted to do is I wanted them to add and an Ivy League graduate, please. Like add it to the end of my title. If you're gonna talk about me, let's do it. So I ended up going to Columbia. After Columbia University or during my years at Columbia, I realized that even though it's an Ivy League institution, there's still a lot of people just like us, just like me, low income, people of color in a community that it's filled with people of color. So I took my advocacy to New York and I did a lot of stuff over there. I worked with a lot of organizations. My last year during the pandemic, I ended up being part of a task force at Columbia to educate not just the students, but also our community about um, COVID. As COVID was happening, as things were coming out, one thing that we did is to make sure that the community knew how to stay six feet away and provide hand sanitizer and all the things that we were just learning. Um, through that, by the time I graduated, um, I also am part of Young Invincibles. And what they do is they advocate for young people between the ages of 18 and 34. So through them, there was a job opportunity to do the same thing I'm doing right now, or the same thing I did my last year, which was advocate and outreach. So now in California, what I do is I focus on advocating and outreaching to young people about vaccinations. So I'm the California Outreach Specialist here with y'all. So that's kind of what I'm doing. And I guess I answered your question. Like that's the path I took right after I graduated. <laughs> Yeah, um, that kind of feeds into the next question is why why did you choose uh, the path that you did? Was there a moment or a spark that you were maybe doing a club or organizations in undergrad that kind of wanted you to further pursue um, working within the legal field and not just going directly to law school, but finding kind of your own path within it? I'll just leave. Sorry, Rosie. I saw you were muting, so that's fine. You're ready. Go <laughs> for it. Going to like finishing what I was talking about, right? Finish, finish. So uh, one of the best classes I took at Columbia was about um, the context in the Constitution. And as COVID was happening, as vaccines were barely getting talked about, one thing that we researched was what we already know. People of color are going to be the less informed, not because we're people of color, just because our communities are not gonna get the same funding as other communities do. And we saw the inequality, we saw the disproportion in information being out in different languages, just everything that could happen happened. We saw our infrastructure of the reality of what it is to be a poor person in America. And we saw the reality of what it is to be a poor person of color in America. So for me, that, I mean, it's always been the drive, but seeing how COVID has, really changed a lot of things is what led me to join YI and join them in this campaign to get communities of color informed specifically. While we do focus on young people, I want young people of color to know that we care, that I care, that they need the same information that other people won't get. And that's kind of like my drive. Anyways, thank you, Rosie. I was like going into that. No, that was good. I'm glad you finished your thought. So I, Let's see, I didn't really choose this route, the route chose me type of situation, right? <laughs> um, I've always been rooted and I will continue to always be rooted in my family's history and their struggle and their resiliency. Um, you know, I'm the proud daughter of immigrants. My dad is from Mexico. My mom's a war refugee from El Salvador, came during the time of war, was also a um, activist and organizer in Salvador um, and continues to do the work here. And so I, when I went to undergrad, I mean, I really resonate with you, Jennifer, you know, also low income, first generation, right? So really wasn't, I mean, I kind of knew that university was there, but also wasn't really sure that that was my path, but also felt like I had to go, but also didn't know how to go, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Um, first gen, you know, the, I, the typical first gen type of situation, right? So that was me. Um, and then I also really sucked in school, like straight up. Um, and then I was like, well, maybe I'm not going to make it to the university, but maybe I will. I don't know. I, I figured it out somewhat, somewhat along the way. Then I went to community college, right? But I still didn't think that I could be a lawyer or did, still didn't think that I could measure up to these type of 
you know, um, positions or careers. Um, and at some point I was like, well, if they can do it, so can I, right? Like if they can take these positions, so can I. Um, and then, um, so I ended up going to community college and I went to transfer to UCLA, right? Did that. And then at some point I was like, I want to be a lawyer. Like I want to do immigration law. That's what I want to do. And then somewhere along the line, um, my professor who I worked with, who's the current director of the UCLA prison education program was like, why not social work before? Like you want to do law? Cool. But well, why not social work? I was like, I'm not going to be no social worker. Social workers just go take, you know, take, take kids from families. That was my perception, right? Because in our communities, that's what they do. Right. And they, and that's real. They still continue to do that. And uh, further criminalize our communities, right? Um, but then I, as I was doing the work with the prison ed program, I noticed how public defenders and uh, social workers had to work together. And a lot of the times they would re-traumatize their clients, right? My students. Um, and so in seeing those dynamics, also from a personal perspective as the most formally educated in my family, I had to navigate many legal systems for my family, both in immigration and criminal defense, right? So I saw how attorneys would re-traumatize and then that's kind of where the spark came and said, well, what if I had, what if, you know, more attorneys were more trauma-informed? What if more attorneys had backgrounds as social workers that knew how to speak with clients? Um, and so that's when that kind of came, all kind of came together and I was like, all right, let me give this a shot before going to law school. Let me try um, social work school. And I actually ended up going to Columbia. Also just kind of fell into that, right? I was not dreaming about Columbia. I didn't even know what Columbia was at some point, right? It just kind of happened and it all kind of fell into place. And I ended up getting a full ride to Columbia, right? To the, to the School of Social Work. So it's like, genuinely, I didn't choose the path, the path kind of chose me and that's part of my journey, right? But I'm always, always, always rooted in my purpose and my purpose has always been, you know, for the community, right? Rooted into my family's story, the resiliency and the community that helped raise me because I want to always come back, always bring it back and become a better resource. That's really, really great, both of you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I guess the, the next kind of follow up question for that was, what was a challenge that you faced during your journey uh, getting to these now really great institutions, these kind of, uh, these really hallmark places that you've both been able to find yourself as, when you look back, what was kind of like, either if there was a, a moment or a challenge that kind of sticks out of your, of your mind while going through that journey? I'm not gonna lie to you, um, it was all a challenge. Like just applying to a predominantly white institution was a mental challenge because we already have that pushback of, am I good enough? Do I really deserve to go there? But then you kind of like snap out of it and you're like, yeah, I fucking do. Sorry, I do. I, I do belong to these places. And then when you apply and then you know, you're waiting, once you do get accepted though, it's still the same battle. It's predominantly white students, um, predominantly white professors, but I try to pick like professors of color and women, uh, ended up having a good experience with that. But it's always a battle internally and the forces that are there, like students come from very wealthy social economic places that I didn't. Um, their understandings and perspectives were very different than mine. And I'm also older, but Rosie, that's awesome, you got a full ride. I didn't, right? So one of my struggles was um, financial. I worked two jobs and I side hustled a lot. And I did a bunch of random jobs for the last two years of my Columbia University experience. And uh, I use a food pantry sometimes because you had to do it. Like you want food, that's where it's at. And I also did like a lot of other things that I needed to do just so that I could be at the same level. Students were talking about spring break. I was, for me, it was how can I do these readings during my spring break in order to be able to work these other times and be able to balance both my work life and my school life and my finances. 
Um, but yeah, um, I don't, I think I'm, I'm believing that imposter syndrome isn't real anymore in the sense that it is white supremacy culture telling us that we don't belong there. And now I'm pushing back. When I feel uncomfortable, I try to remember that, you know, who's uncomfortable? All these other white people in the room who are looking at me and they're like, damn, this Latina that's not code switching in front of us is like being very direct. And yes, yes, I am. And you don't like it. I'm not going to make my language palatable to academia. And I'm not going to make myself smaller just because other people can't handle all of this, right? Like, I know it sounds like a lot, but I'm, I'm trying to be real with y'all because this is, it was a struggle every day for people to look at your, you wearing your shirt like or your sweater that said Columbia and you're on the train for like half an hour and people are just staring and looking up and down, trying to figure out if you really go there. By the time you get to school, you feel the same way. By the time you're done with a lecture where they're talking about Mexicanos, hicieron esto, this and that, because my family's Mexican too. It's like, they're talking about you, but they make you feel like the other. They make you feel like we're a history we're an existence that an existence that isn't there when I'm literally sitting right there next to them, right? So these are the hardest struggles for me. Um, but you know, I graduated, so like I didn't say the word, but you know what I'm saying, right? You okay, got boy. off that 115 stop and said, "Yes, this is my stop." <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, it was all hard. It's all been hard. It's still hard, right? <laughs> um, if I could have like a dollar or even actually a penny for every time I've cried, I'd be a millionaire. Like it's bien chillona, pero you know, chingona for sure. I, I, you gotta keep going, right? <laughs> um, let's see, I think, yeah, the, the feeling of, you know, these, the whole process of just like the application or everything being so new, right? Just being in a new space, not having a tia or my dad or my mom could be like, hey, you've been through this, can you help me with this application? Like, no, I didn't have that, right? Or I didn't have, I don't have like someone in my circle who's a lawyer and I could just be like, hey, can you, can you review this law school application? Like it's all been a learning process and having to learn like how to apply, what you need to do, how to set yourself up for success, whatever that means, right? Um, and like, you know, thinking about that, it's all been kind of like trial and error for me, but to end it on a positive note, right? It's like, you're doing it for other people too. You're paving the way, right? And the whole goal of this is not to be the only person in these positions, but you know, paving the way for other people, for our own family members, for our own community to, so that they know like, okay, Rosie's there, I can do it too, right? Let me go ask Rosie, let me be, you know, let's have her be accessible and like share her experience so that other people like her can also make it to these spaces. And I'll be the Thea that I didn't have, right? That was like working in the legal field, I'll be that. like. Um, who teaches me how to follow through with networks, right? Like I, I, I would meet people and I'm like, and they would like introduce me via email. I'm like, well, how do I respond? Like, I didn't know how to respond. Or they would, um, or like interviews, something so simple, right? Like, I didn't know what to wear to the interview. Like what, you know, it's like things that matter that sometimes we take for granted. And we're like, we don't know that that's, you know, something that, people have to teach you or have to talk to you about those things. So it's some, for me, it was like those small things that some kept like piling up throughout my journey. And sometimes it felt like, oh my gosh, one more thing. Like, like I'm close to giving up, right? But then always bringing it back to my purpose, always remembering that. And then that's what, you know, kind of keeps me moving forward. And to this day, you know, it still gets hard. It's not easy. I'm not exactly where I want to be, but I'm still pushing forward, still thinking about my purpose and, and getting there. And in reflecting on these, you know, either the whole journey it's in and of itself or these small moments that kind of build up, if you yourself now, you know, looking back, you've accomplished all the things that you had set out for, um, if you could go back and give yourself some advice or or just some general direction, because um, obviously you can't go back to each moment and give yourself the perfect advice, but if you could kind of go back 
um, what would be some sort of moment that you would you would go back and tell yourself some advice that you'd want you'd wish someone would have told you I am a very type a type of person so I want things I want to plan things and I want to make them happen right and sometimes that backfires so like if I have I'm gonna write it down and then I'll be like okay this is what I need to do and like sometimes I'm not flexible with myself so if there's one thing I could tell me, it's like, be flexible, be open to other opportunities, right? And don't block myself from those possibilities. Um, so for me, you know, after undergrad, I was like, I want to go to law school. And it didn't happen for me because it wasn't supposed to happen right there, right? Because I was supposed to go to social work and then work at the public defender's office and then go to law school because that's eventually going to make me a better attorney, right? And so like being flexible with myself and I know it sounds corny and we always hear it in post or whatever, but really trusting and enjoying the journey is all part of it because, you know, the, the moment and where you're at right now is special and you're never going to relive it again. Right. So like enjoying this time of your life, this etapa, like this moment. Right. And then moving on to the next, it's going to be really, really important. I love it. I meet, I meet so many people type A that would love that, Rosie. Um, I think for me, I'm more of a wild card. Um, I think my problem is that I, I think when I was younger and, you know, I'm already told you my age. I mean, I'm amazing for 34, but, all, you know, I wish when I was younger, I didn't believe that the system was correct. I always thought that I couldn't go to school because I, I just, I didn't have what the system said I needed. You know, like I didn't have the best grades after high school. Yeah, I was working. My family needed food on the table. Sorry, I, I wasn't that kid. I didn't have A's, I was sleeping, I was tired. Um, but the system makes you think that there's like this, this path, right? Right after high school, you have to get into school and that's how you end up where you end up. I wish I knew that the breaks I took and that the time it took me to get here, that it was all okay. Um, I wish someone would have told me that it doesn't matter how poor you are. It doesn't matter how many people tell you that, yeah, but you're a girl. Um, or that, you know, these spaces weren't made for us. When I was younger, I wish I knew these things. And now at this age, graduating from a Ivy League institution where a lot of my classmates literally were not just social, not just economically wealthy, but socially wealthy, right? They have connections. Right after college, they're gonna go work for their mom and dad or whatever the hell they're gonna do, but not me. I have to make these connections and I have to work and I have to go to school. I think the best thing I could have told myself is we, even though we're not made for these places, cause let's be real, none of these laws created were ever intended for us, right? The idea of us being here was never the intention of this country. And in spite of all that, I'm with all of y'all in the Zoom call talking about how amazing we are, right? And that's gonna be my flex for the day. But I think to realize that we can be here despite of all that pushback is what I carry with me every day. I'm not gonna make my hair super lacio and all the way tied back. I'm not gonna hide my big old lips. I'm gonna put my you know, lipstick and I'm gonna wear my hoops because these are like part of me. So I think the biggest thing is never make yourself small. And I didn't. I think that's the biggest thing I would have learned earlier. I learned it late, pero se los quiero pasar a ustedes, right? Like, don't take up all that space, honey. All of it. Because that's what you deserve and more. Anyways, that's it. I always go on like really long speeches, y'all. My bad. Like, no, no, no. This is supposed to be inspiring. So, todo está bien. All is good. All is good. Um, our next question kind of looks towards more of like a future outlook, um, kind of looking back at the goals that you had set at yourself, maybe at the beginning of graduation, or I guess the end of graduation, beginning of journeying into a career, and how those uh, goals might have changed, and, and how and how and why they changed. Well, for me, I mean, the the goal is still law school, right? I, I'm still gonna do that, even though 
I do, I mean, I work hand in hand with attorneys every day and I do holistic defense. And I think that that's one thing I learned about this new way of practicing law, um, especially in with the public defenders. Um, I started doing it at the Bronx Defenders. So at first I was like, maybe I'll just do, maybe I'll just be a public defender or maybe I'll just do, you know, um, immigration. But now I want to be, you know, I would do immigration. I would do both. And, um, you know, because recognizing that people's lives are multi-layered and they're affected by many systems at once. And that's how law should be practiced anyways, right? Um, through a trauma-informed lens. So that's what I want to do. Um, I'll still continue to work at the public defender's office. Um, I really am enjoying what I'm doing. Um, primarily work with people who are severely mentally ill and um, deemed incompetent to stand trial, which is a whole other conversation and a whole other topic, right, of, of law. But um, yeah, that's still the goal, still trying uh, eventually to go to law school, but I'm taking my time with it because what I'm doing, I think is important and I'm enjoying it. So for me, it's um, similar. I still want to go to law school, but I think this opportunity with Young Invincibles as, even though it's a, if I say, even though it's because again, you know, I'm very, in my, in my head, I'm very radical and progressive, but they are a very nonpartisan advocacy group, but they're very progressive. And I chose to work for them through this campaign because when I was in New York, um, the friends that I've had that are people of color who weren't at Columbia, it was just so many chismosa. So the people I met in my neighborhood, I literally like know people that consistently lost somebody throughout the whole year, right? So I chose to take this path first, knowing that I will end up at law school and eventually end up running for public office. Cause I'm just tired. I didn't want to, I'm gonna be honest with you. I thought I would be a dope teacher for like young brown kids, teaching them like how to read and like, you know, cultura and all this other stuff. I really, really thought, damn, I'm gonna be a good teacher. And then life just hits you hard. And you realize, no, I can't, I can't be a teacher. I, I mean, I can, but I need these white people in office to like, just give a damn about people of color. Cause no matter how many kids I can teach, the system has made it almost impossible for us to reach spaces that were not made for us. So, you know, vote for me eventually. I don't know where, but that's kind of like, you know, that's like my main goal and I know I'm going to do it. And I want law school because I don't want to be a um, lifetime politician. I want to go in make changes and like provide a pathway for somebody else. I want to eventually have my own law firm. I want to be able to help people. Um, for me, it's like labor laws. I love labor laws, mostly because labor laws should have to include everybody regardless of documentation, right? So for me, that's kind of like one of my pet peeves, especially in California, where our agriculture is the agriculture of the country, not just our state. Um, oh my God, I rant like everywhere, but I'm showing you all my all my spaces, yeah. So my goal is to do that, and I I want to do these pathways, and I'm gonna do it. You know, just like Rosie, we're gonna go back into those paths of uh, going into law school. I do want Esquire at the end of my name. I want white people to be like, who's running for office? Who's this Latina? It's, excuse me, it's Esquire at the end. You could just go by Esquire. That's kind of like the goal, you know? So take up space, y'all. estoy diciendo, every time I always tell people, just take up that space and we're going to do it in law too. We're going to change that 2% to a higher percentage. The goal is to change that 2%. Thank you. That, that, that concludes our, our pre- um our pre-created questions, but we do have some questions that got submitted to us throughout the uh, panel. So the first one is for Rosie, if you could clarify what holistic defense means and what you were kind of saying about the dynamics of the social worker and how that kind of feeds into the public defender slash defense and how they kind of mutually coincide. Yeah, that's a really good question. So. Holistic defense is a model of, the simplest way of saying it is that the client is at the center 
And it's practicing law with the understanding that the client is the expert because they know their own lives, right? They own their own lives. And so they know what is best for them. And so um, in a traditional defense model, the attorney would be, right? In a defense model, right? Um, the attorney would be the person who's spearheading everything. It's like, I'm telling you what needs to happen, right? In a holistic defense model, the client would be at the center and they're connected to not only the attorney, but to community um, providers and also to a social worker, investigator, and several other people playing a role in the, in the defense case. So that's a piece of it, right? And then there's also what I mentioned earlier that the understanding that people's lives are affected by many systems at once because our lives are multi-layered, right? And so if I, for example, am an immigrant woman who just got caught stealing something, right? I now have an immigration case. I have a criminal case. And let's say I'm a single mom. Now I have a family case. So I have three different things that I need to deal with, right? And so for someone who is low in income, right, or a they don't have the capacity to hire a, a criminal defense attorney, a family defense attorney, an immigration attorney, right? So then what holistic defense does is like a team of people, a team of attorney, team of advocates working together to help that person. And because of that, you're also helping their family. Um, and so you're not just in contact with the client, but you're also in contact with family members helping them on their cases. Um, so it's really a whole team of people working together on people's cases because we understand that those are people's lives and the consequences are very real and they deserve more than just, you know, we're going to provide the very minimum and then you figure out the rest, paying money, cuando puedas, wherever you can, right? So that's kind of what holistic defense is about. And there was more to the question, what was it? Uh, no, I was just kind of clarifying a little bit of what I think they were saying, just asking what holistic defense was and how it like kind of goes with a public defender's approach. Yeah. But I sounds oh, yeah. And then the Bronx defenders, you can look up, the, if that's something that you're interested in, look up the Bronx defenders. They were the first to create this type of model. They're the largest public defender's office in the Bronx, New York, who has this kind of model. And then there's other states now doing that. Santa Barbara, where I'm working at now, has recently, like a few years back, started adopting this model and is a lot smaller than the Bronx Defenders, but is still growing and it's heading towards that way. And then um, we'll go ahead and I think at the end, we'll probably just create a, like a resource page if you're both comfortable with putting your contact information for anyone who might want to follow up and I'll put in a link just to Bronx Defenders um, if they're more interested. And then we also had a question uh, for Jennifer about how people might get involved in the Young Invincibles or how if there is like a way to get involved as an undergraduate in that. Yes. So amazingly enough, we are one of the few organizations that pay our fellows. So we have um, a fellowship that you can apply to um, because I'm an outreach specialist. If you hear snoring, so sorry. There's I have a pug and he's so loud. It's embarrassing. But oh, you know, Zoom life. Um, I can drop a link and you could contact me and I could put you in contact with people um, at the West Coast because we have a whole West Coast team and you can get involved. There is so, we, okay, sorry, his snoring is really bothering me. Um, so what we advocate for is health, um, education, anything that involves you as a young person, we're the advocates for. The, re the reality is that this was created like in the nineties by white people, but it's okay because they were still young. It has transformed into something very progressive. It has transformed into giving us the voice that we never really had. It's always advocating for older people as though we don't vote, but they'll give us like loans and they'll let us join the military at 18, right? So I will drop all my info for y'all to, you know, find out more and join us, you know? It's all about y'all's young voices that will make a difference. Um. Let me see. 
uh, anyone from the audience have any questions in the chat or you can raise your voice uh, other than that that might be kind of all we have then <laughs> so maybe finishing a bit early um, but thank you both again oh we have one question in the chat saying i'm thinking of going into corporate law but part of my uh, feeling of guilt for considering going into it. Um, maybe either of you could talk about, I think I understand the question. Um, I could clarify it a bit more, but if you both know what that person is trying to convey, um, go, go for it. Um, I went to a predominantly, we both went to a predominantly white institution with elitist classmates, okay? Like I could tell you people, I was getting food from the food pantry and people were talking about like tuna tartare for breakfast you taking up spaces in corporations that you feel like, okay, but I wanna do things for my community. You can take spaces in these like corporations and then bring it back, you know, destroy them from the inside. Eventually Columbia will not be a predominantly white institution. It's gonna be an institution with a bunch of people, right? So like, don't see it as, okay, well, I'm betraying my community. I mean, don't work for Nestle unless you feel like you're gonna destroy Nestle. So I have a pet peeve with them. But if you do work for them, like let me know the cheese mate, you know, so I could like destroy them from the outside. But always think about it as like, you're going in to a space that wasn't for you and you're gonna bring it back to the community. So if you feel guilty like that, then think about it that way. If you feel like it's selfish, it's not selfish because you're going into spaces that weren't meant for us, right? Um, my biggest thing is bring it back. like. If you feel bad about it, or if you want to really do something for not just yourself, but for generations after you, bring it back. Learn, do everything you have to do to get to the top, but always remember your community and always remember um, like where you come from. I think that's the biggest thing I can say, because that's how I feel at Columbia. I was like, damn, all these white kids. And I don't gonna be mean, but it's true, okay? Like they were super wealthy and they would be telling me, oh, well, you probably made it here because of, you know what? I'm like, yeah, you're probably a legacy, okay? Like. Let's get down to it. If we're gonna start having these arguments, it's gonna be like this. So I think the biggest thing that made me feel comfortable is knowing that I'm not just gonna be the Latina at Colombia or the one person of color. It's we're creating pathways for other people like y'all to see that you can get there too, despite of how much money you have or you don't, because I don't have any. I still don't have any, like, let's get real, I don't have that much. Pero like, just take over those spaces, y'all. Anyways, sorry, Rosie, if you wanna say something, go for it. I'm over here ranting like I do. No, I, I really appreciate that. I think I also, I agree with you. Don't feel guilty. Take up those. We need you in those spaces, right? Like the corporate world, a lot of us don't know what's happening because we don't have our own people in those spaces, right? So we need you to, we need your ideas. We need you to transform these spaces as well. And so it's, you know, it could be isolating at times. It could feel, you will feel some type of way, right? Because you're not gonna be um, around POCs. It's very white in those spaces, but take up space. Um, if that's what you feel moved to do, do it. Get that money, right? We also do not have to be poor to do good. And um, there's also importance in, you know, you gotta make your money too. And so like, um, and like um, Jennifer said, bring it back. Always bring it back to the community that helped raise you. Oh, I see another one, a question here. Let's see. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and read it out just because the recording doesn't uh, capture the question. But um, in the chat, there's a question, what are tips for remaining motivating throughout the entire process? As you two have mentioned, there are moments where we are going to feel discouraged and this person has encountered this feeling regularly, being a, a low-income first-generation uh, Mexican college student. Also, this student is at UC Berkeley, so I think that kind of fits into this feeling of displacement as well. <laughs> I know this is gonna sound really corny, but I do this for myself and it's helped that, you know, this far. Write a purpose for yourself, like genuinely spend some time and write, start a sentence with my purpose is. And this will help guide you. And no matter what happens, you can always come back 
and your purpose will always lead you to the right way. Your purpose will always continue to motivate you, no matter what that purpose is. I hope it's it's a well-intended purpose, right? <laughs> um, not something like wild that's gonna harm others, right? But but write yourself a purpose, really, you know, something, I like to be, leave people with tangible things, right? And so like one tangible thing that you can do for yourself is spending some time on your own, take yourself on a date to the coffee shop or something, eat some good food, spend some time journaling, open up something and just put my purpose is and write down your purpose and your purpose will always keep you motivated. Your purpose will always lead you right to where you need to be. Um, I would also recommend even in institutions that are, you know, not just super white, but other institutions, academia could be very racist regardless of who we are. It's also very classist, right? So sometimes you feel like I don't speak like them. I don't talk like them. I don't use SAT language. And I don't, I really don't. That I, I leave that for the papers and sometimes the right click, you know, thesaurus. But just remember, um, create that community with other people because they feel like you. They might be shy, but they feel just like you in these spaces. Find them, like really find them. Even if you feel a little uncomfortable, talk to some people. Trust me that you will find your community in this process. And the second thing for me is I always um, have a whiteboard and I write some, I guess, mantras, but it's something that I always tell myself. So I'll read them to y'all, okay? Um, the first one is always a chingarle con that bad bitch energy. I wake up, that's the first thing I see. I'm like, yes, I will. Two, stay true to the soil. Eso is like, remember where you come from. Remember why you're doing this, right? Um, be intentional. For me, that's always be honest, be true to myself never change who I am. And then nothing about us without us is my one of my, my favorite ones. Um, it did come from an activist um, for people that are differently abled, correct? Um, there's language is changing. So I'm sorry if I'm not if I don't I'm not up to date with it. And I know it's a problem and I'll work on that. But I think knowing that nothing about us without us is the reality that people faced back then and we're still facing today in 2021 also helps me remember that we belong here. And I think together with creating that community, um, even your bad days, just remember that chingona energy, like just, or chingon or chinex, whatever, chin, chingem, I don't know. We have to work on it, right? Cause I'm not gonna tell people what they identify as. I'm sharing to you what I identify as. Uh, that really just kind of like does it for me. That clip, that kind of like snaps me out of it. Sometimes it doesn't. And the third thing is when it doesn't, remember your boundaries. You don't have to prove to anybody how great you are. Um, and I don't mean it because you are amazing. I just mean it like you don't have to feel like you have to do extra work to feel that you do belong in these spaces. Sometimes people be like, hey, do this event, do this. And sometimes you have to say no. And it's okay. It's okay to, to say no. It's okay not to stretch yourself just because you feel like, well, I have to prove that I do belong here, that I'm able. No, no, you don't. You're already in. You're already at Berkeley. You're already at these institutions. They should be grateful the time that you could give them, but also be be as kind to your own self and create those boundaries. Okay, like that's it. Someone's like, "Hey, let's go drinking." Okay, yeah, but only till two, right? Create boundaries whenever you can. Don't feel like, okay, well, I made friends and I have to do. No, no, no. Create those boundaries. Self care in places like this is so important. And let's get real. Our comunidad does not talk about it. Our moms think we're lazy. Our parents think we're not doing nothing. And it's like, ma'am, I just read a hundred pages and it was all about Jim Crow. Like, don't tell me I'm being lazy. I'm just digesting all the racism, right? So just like those things, you know, like that's what I want you to remember when you're struggling with this. And also like hit up people, yo soy bien chismosa. Like you wanna talk to somebody that's gonna like hype you up? I'll give you my IG, you know? Just like stuff like that, like just create that community because the reality is that it's it's only in spaces like this that we're gonna be able to create social mobility, right? Other people from wealth created through wealth and they have connections. We don't, we have to create it through spaces like this, through invites from a friend's friend that hey, says, hey, my friend is doing this, can you do a Zoom? I'm like, yeah, I'll show up, what's up? This is where you do it, okay? Oh my God, 
Alex, I'm totally ranting, dude. I'm so sorry. Yo, I'm you so sorry. Okay. This actually, one, one last thing about this reminds me of an unspoken truth. And that is also the fact that this journey causes or could cause a big toll in our mental health, right? So one thing that's really, really important is checking in with yourself, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally as well. That's really, really important because we need you to continue doing this. We need you in these spaces, but it's not at the cost of your mental health or at the cost of your well-being, right? So in times when you're also feeling discouraged, I think it's important for all of us to really check in with ourselves and be like, why am I feeling discouraged? Am I feeling some type of way because I need to take a break, right? And that's also really important. Do I need to not just self-preserve, but just take a break and, you know, think about something else for a little bit and then come back to it. Or, you know, I think that's really, really important. Something that we don't talk about too much or sometimes at all. And so having this conversation and just a reminder of like checking in with yourself emotionally and mentally is really, really important. Yeah, I mean, this is what the, the whole entirety of this whole panel is really just to, to inspire and to build community and, and just showcase how, how we can get there and we have gotten there and we can do it again and we will continue to keep doing it. Um, but I, if there's any more questions for, for our panelists, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, but I, I think we're coming into a close and I'll go ahead and take down both of your contact information, um, any links also of either of you um, want to put on, we have like a resource document, we just keep a list of everything that we've collected through doing these panels. Um, hopefully we'll also reach out again and keep keep doing these spaces and keep holding these these talks because they're important and, and they don't happen often enough uh, for people and for the community that they should. Um, but thank you, thank you both very much. Um, we're also gonna do one last group photo. Um, we also have a, some board members here that I feel like we should at least say, uh, let them introduce themselves, maybe with Eric, Yusenia, Mayra. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I can go at it first. Uh, sorry, guys, my voice sounds a bit uh, like roughy right now. For some reason, I just had having like a really quote unquote sick day, but you know, we all got to get through those bad days. Um, so first of all, uh, my name, of course, is Eric Esparza. I'm the president and founder of Latinos in Law. We actually just started this semester as a full active semester. This is our first semester as an official RS on campus. Uh, really what I want to say is muchas gracias, Jennifer and Rosie, for coming tonight. I know sometimes it's difficult to come to these panels, but it really means a lot. You two are, of course, like amazing, beautiful Latina women who are really paving the way for those of us in the future, you're people we can look up to, you're people who are really showing us that, you know, the impossible is possible and you're setting that, that path. So thank you so much for everything you mentioned. Thank you for the phenomenal advice and thank you for, for everything. And really like you two are just really amazing. So with that, I'll pass it over to Yesenia. Hi everyone, I'm Yesenia. I'm the co-finance director for this org. And I just want to say thank you. I actually um, just broke down like two days ago. I, um, found myself stuck and it's just like something that's been happening happening a lot recently as a Latina woman um you know like just like being a Latina woman being in Berkeley imposter syndrome like everything going on is really tough and um, just hearing you both and seeing like hearing about your stories of like success and how you guys are still like striving to like go to law school really like motivates me to keep going and I'm just really thankful for you to be here and like provide a space for us to like listen to your stories and you know relate and also like I don't know just be inspired and motivated in times that might not be the easiest yeah and I'll pass it on to my dog hi thank you so much my name is Myra I'm actually the marketing officer for Latinos in law I just joined this semester and I'm also a transfer student and so being at Berkeley is really different and at the amount of white students that we have here definitely just feel left out sometimes and so just being a part of this community Latinos in law just and hearing you guys like rants and like dance like I appreciate it all and like I can understand you guys thank you okay and then um, I think we'll go ahead and do a little group picture uh, if anyone else wants to put on their camera uh, no worries if you don't oh shoot. Okay, so I'll count down to three. Okay, three, two, one. Cool, okay. I think 
Uh, we'll go ahead and conclude right at six then if anyone has any questions, comments. Okay. Bye. Um, I do, just one sec. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yesenia, we were all in your shoes at one moment in our in our life and we felt utterly alone. Um, just know that like now that you've met us, connect with us. I am here virtually, pero también on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter sometimes, you know, whatever. But like when you find people, like find them, reach out. Like I know it's hard to talk about this because low key, like I was like, I was like, I'm just gonna take a picture. You're like llorando, like I'm llorando right now, right? Like I gotta suck in those tears. And then she, and then Alex is like, yeah, we're taking a picture, yeah. But like, don't, don't let fear stop you from reaching out and sharing your fears, okay? Because one thing that's very easy for other people in these spaces, and I don't mean this, I mean like our academia spaces, is for them to be like comfortable enough to not have to worry about the things we worry about. Going on, going out when it's dark, because we're women going out to certain places because we're also women and we're Latinas, even within our brown <laughs> men community, right? Even like going into our campus where a lot of schools have faced sexual assault and Title IX means nothing, right? All these things, plus you have to get good grades, plus you wanted to go to law school, plus you might have to work, put food on the table, whatever it is. And then you have family that tells you mental health is not a thing. That's my family, right? <laughs> When you find people that understand your community, understand your feelings, when you, you find someone that goes down, self-care, connect with those people. Don't be scared to share that fear because trust me, I felt just like you. And the, the best thing about this is I'm 34, okay? I'm assuming y'all are way younger than me. I mean, I look great and I'm gonna keep saying that because you know, Latina and shit. But you're in a place that I wasn't at your age. I'm doing this at 34 years old and I'm not gonna stop. I cannot fathom how amazing all of y'all are gonna be at your age right now, right? Like imagine like being in your shoes at this age, what is it like 22, 21, 18, whatever it is, you know, you're all young, but you're doing something that I couldn't do at that age. And you might feel like no one gets you and I totally understand that. And I want you to know that I'm proud of you and I don't know you, but I'm proud of you. Cause I wish I could have been the young lady you are right now. I wish I could have had that motivation at your age to go to school, right? And I'm doing this at a, as a old, I'm a senora now. I'm in a soccer league and I'm the senora in the team, right? So like, you're you're years ahead of me. So I'm proud of that shit, and I'm I can't wait to see your you succeed. And you know what? Those tears, all they do is gonna moisturize you, girl. Cause look at this skin. I've been crying day one. Anyways, that's it. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That means a lot. Muchas gracias. Like always, really appreciate you two coming out tonight. We hope we can remain in contact so we can hopefully invite you to any future events and we can allow you to continue to share your amazing stories. Muchas gracias and have a good night. Thank you.